Hi, I'm Doug Robinson. I got a movie for you that I made in 1988. It's one of the very first rock videos of all time. So all my life, I've had two careers. I'm a writer and I'm a climbing guide. And put those together into making <coughs> of this video that you're about to see, Moving Over Stone. It took us a year to make it. And my partner, Mike Strassman, on it, um, is unfortunately gone now, but he was just out of UCLA film school and came to me. He had never made anything over five minutes before. <laughs> and he came to me and goes, let's make a climbing video. And I go, great, good idea. And that's where it all started. And we had no idea then that it would take us a year to make the thing. And I'll tell you more of those stories afterwards. Rock, the vertical playground. Rock will teach you how to climb. All kinds of rock. Granite. Volcanic rock. Sandstone. Follow the shapes of the stone. Movement is the heart of climbing, carrying it from stance to dance. <whistles> Learning to climb. When you've spent your life on the rocks, climbing, guiding, writing about it, it's hard to know where to begin. Everyone seems to have their own reasons to climb, to be out here. I like the simplicity, space and silence. And movement. That's what this video is about, moving over stone. Relate your body to the rock. Let the rock show you how to climb. Climbing is not brute force overpowering the rock. It's delicate, graceful movements. Good climbers stay balanced. They seem to flow over the stone. Relax. Step lightly. It'll ease your first steps towards getting vertical. It's not just muscle. Climbing demands concentration. The next few holds can be like a chess problem, and the key to climbing them is visualizing the right sequence mentally rehearsing the moves before making them. Visualizing is a powerful technique. We'll use it a lot. But high off the ground, fear can paralyze motion. As you become more comfortable on the rock, confidence begins to balance fear, allowing you to concentrate on moving. Fear is healthy. It keeps us alive. If I ever lost my fear completely, I'd quit climbing. Video is a great tool for learning how to climb. We can watch movement, then imitate. That's called imaging. I'll run through the basic holds and simple moves right here in the buttermilk. Then we'll take a climbing trip. Learn more advanced technique from some of the best climbers in the world. Image off their movement. The moves go in your eyes and out your feet. Bypass the brain. The more climbing you see, the faster you'll learn. But the best way to learn is to climb a lot. Oddly enough, the biggest thing that gets in the way of learning to climb is its technology. Ropes, hardware, this gear is important. Your life depends on it. But you can't learn to use it from a video. That's a hands-on lesson. Be safe. Learn the ropes from a guide, okay? So, let's forget about the technology. No hardware. 
Put the rope aside for now. Get back to what climbing's all about. Movement. The feel of muscle on stone. Whoa! Well, guess this is the bare minimum. Just shoes. For learning, shoes are the only technology we really need. Flexible and sensitive, you can feel the stone right through the sole. And boy, do they stick. Rock shoes are bred for friction, but they don't have balance. That's got to come from you. Put feet in them and feel how good balance improves friction. Stay poised and they grip better. Balance and friction, they work together, and together they form the basis of all climbing. At the foot of the Sierra, it's shoe demo day. Some of the best climbers in the country have come to try out the new crop of shoes. Try a pair on. They should be comfortable, but snug. You'll notice how sticky these shoes are. Climbing shoes have really evolved since I started. 30 years ago, TM Herbert and I used to climb in stiff, lug soled boots. Now his son Tommy sports a high-tech rubber compound on lightweight shoes. Who knows what Donnie Herbert will be wearing in a few years. Although rubber keeps getting stickier, it's still skill that drives you up the rock. Well, once you get up to it, Pop, you're going to set yourself up so you can cross over to the left hand over there. That's kind of a hard move. What did you do? Put your right foot up? Yeah. The years keep refining skill, but there are always harder climbs. Climbing in balance sounds easy, but instinct says to hug the rock. Cling to Mother Earth. But that takes the weight off your feet and puts it all on your arms, which throws your center of balance off, and your arms start getting tired. You're spotted, I got you. Try it again. No, use your feet. Push yourself up the rock. Your legs are a lot stronger than your arms. So find your center of balance and stand over the balls of your feet. Good, stay relaxed. How many hand and footholds can you find in this picture? As you get to know the rock, you'll see holds everywhere. This is an edge, the best of footholds. Stand over your big toe, the strongest part of your foot, and balance, always. As edges get smaller, not as much of your foot fits, so roll the foot onto the edge. My next hold is not an edge at all, but a dish in the rock, a friction hold. Ease onto it. Steep friction is hard to trust, but the more pressure I put on my feet, the better they stick. This is called smearing. It takes finesse. Good footwork is really important. It takes the weight off your arms and conserves energy. A sure sign of experience is delicate and creative footwork. I can practice footwork and balance without using my arms at all as long as I stay near the ground. When I begin using my hands, they're just for balance. Fingertips hold me steady and away from the rock while I push up with my feet. As it gets steeper, we need handholds, positive pulls. Look at these, buckets, jugs, thank God holds, the best. Smaller holds, arch your fingers to press just the tips onto them. Here I can get only two fingers on the hold, so I wrap my thumb over them to help pull, a ring grip. Rounded holds get palmed, but if the top is too slippery, you can pinch the sides of the hold. You're easily tempted to grip too hard. Try to relax. No white knuckle grips. Pull lightly. The art is in gripping just tight enough. We usually think of pulling on hand holds, but this one switches to a push hold, then is replaced by the feet, a mantle. Mantling works where there's just one hold. Hang straight arm. Work the feet up, then push off to get the weight over your hands. The elbow is locked. Now balance onto your feet. And when you've got a good hold, rest. Remember to move delicately. Ease off one hold and balance onto the next. 
Let gravity do the work. Holds aren't always conveniently horizontal. Sometimes they're vertical, like these edges. Opposing forces keep you on the rock. Pull with your arms and push with your feet in the opposite direction. Use the legs to push yourself towards higher handholds. Look for an opposing hold and stem. Stems are very useful in corners and chimneys, and they can be good enough to give your arms a rest. Sometimes all the holds seem to point down. Pull outward and push with your feet, an undercling. These undercling moves are strenuous, so reach up high with your feet. They stick better. Like all techniques, opposition can be carried to great extremes. Overhangs look intimidating, can be very strenuous, but often have big holds. So you want to conserve energy. Feet are very useful. Keeping them tucked underneath you takes a weight off your arms. Move upward by pushing with your legs. On some overhangs, a heel hook helps to hold you in. Camming your toes is even more secure. Hang with the arms straight. It saves energy. Move quickly and smoothly. Climb positively up overhangs. Dead pointing saves energy. Pull in with the arms, and while your momentum is upward, grab the next hold. Again, spring upward and reach before gravity overpowers you. Now I know you'll want to go out and try the techniques you've just learned. First, find a qualified mountain guide. He'll rope you up safely, a great way to work on fear of heights. Or try bouldering. It's good exercise for your muscles, technique, and judgment. There are a few basic rules, however. You can hurt yourself falling from any height, lessen the chances, remove rocks and debris from the base, and always have a spot. The idea is not to catch the climber, but to break his fall. And don't climb too high. In other words, don't climb up anything you can't climb back down. Now that we've seen some technique, let's take a climbing trip. Before we go, remember, relax your mind and body. Keep the weight over the balls of your feet. Use your feet to push you higher. Conserve arm strength. They're mostly for balance. Oppose feet and hands when holds seem to point the wrong way. Climb efficiently and conserve energy, especially on overhangs. Visualize your moves before making them. And don't forget to have fun. Want to review? Just rewind the tape, put on your favorite tunes, and watch it again. Every time you see it, it strengthens your imaging. Well, let's get on the road and watch some of the best climbers in the world. Tuolumne Meadows, summer camp for Yosemite's notorious hardmen. Here's Floyd, nine years old. He grew up here.
I started a while ago last year. Me and my friend Dylan were trying to do this stuff last year. So far, I was the only one who made it up. Sometimes when my fingers don't fit on them, I either just put my feet in a different place and then I reach my arm up as high as I can and just grab another one. Floyd's a natural. Kids always are. Not many of us were lucky enough to have Yosemite in our backyards, but we were all climbers as kids. Instinctively, we scrambled up trees and over fences. Then we grew up and forgot. So really, we're just remembering movements we already know and applying them to the new medium of stone. Four-year-old Braden Mayfield has friction climbing wired. Good balance. Moves smoothly. This kid's a little hone master. Give me five, bro. Even hard friction isn't that steep, just more delicate. Balance is the key. This glacier polish chips off to form amazing, tiny edges. No fingernails. Arch your fingers to press the tips or the pads onto the edge. The same hold could be edged, but it's just as often smeared. Either way, balancing over it is more important than how your foot sits on the edge. Keep shifting your balance smoothly to the next hold. When you get a good hold, rest. Friction is the delicate end of climbing, where it's often important to keep moving. Knob climbing, Tuolumne's other claim to fame. So it was no surprise to stumble upon British rock ace Jerry Moffat getting a workout at a Tuolumne bouldering area appropriately called the Knobs. This is something really sort of unique to Tuolumne and these knobs in this problem. You don't actually, you, know, you can grab it like this. There's many different ways you can grab things. It's actually best for me. You just hook your hand around it like that, which is really, Really unique. I would have pinched that knob, but Jerry's backhand grip keeps his body closer to the rock, easing the arm strain where it's really steep. These knobs make it possible to climb some of Tuolumne's steepest faces. But when the knobs are far apart, intricate stems and dynamic moves are the key. The, yeah, the, thing, the important thing is and then out is to get momentum and get everything flowing at the same time. So you just gotta get your foot there, hang, and just make everything go in one. And the thing is, you should find hard when you when you're learning to do dynos, dynamic moves, and lunges and jumps and stuff. And you tend to go with your arms, go with your feet at the same time. And you don't get that push. Dynos are complex. The important thing to remember is to push with the feet and be committed. If you have any doubt at all, you won't make. It. John Backer was America's first famous climber. He did hard climbs in unheard of style. Free solo, no rope. Free soloing is not recommended, obviously. The stakes are too high. I broke my back soloing, got off lightly. I'm lucky to be alive and happy to rope up. Oh, I broke it. So why does Backer do it? Is this guy trying to prove something? But after meeting him, I realized he's not a daredevil. He was talking safety, enthused about putting in stronger bolts. Yeah, but 60 seconds to put a bolt into granite. <laughs> John loves to climb, and just for himself. What does he have to prove? He isn't cocky on the rock, but climbs with respect for the void. Rock climbing is an extraordinary art. 
it would be easy for any climber to get egotistical and stop paying attention. Not John Backer. He can't afford to. Tuolumne's domes show that granite doesn't need to be steep to be difficult. Volcanic rock is different. Vertical at least. Good thing it has pockets. Hold it. There's good volcanic climbing just east of Yosemite. This stuff is tough. Volcanic tough. Climbing it can be tough too, unless you know something about pockets. Again, the shape of the rock dictates how you will climb it. Use those pockets. Get all your fingers into them. Pockets are often multi-directional. You can go from a downward pull to a layback and work on up into an undercling. Get all your fingers into them. If you can't, two or three fingers is still a good hold. In really small pockets, you can sometimes stack one finger on top of another. Our opposable thumb gives us a slight advantage over better climbers like lizards and sloths. Use it. It locks you off. Another kind of pinch grip. Footholds are harder to get if the pockets are small. Use your edges. In a big pocket, no need to edge. Just slide your foot on in. Here's a bouldering traverse. Good for endurance. A way to get strong without being too far off the ground. Traverses are a good place to save energy by extending your reach. Crossing hands lets you reach further on the next move. Feet can cross also, but don't get too crossed up. Sometimes it's better to shuffle. The holds will dictate. Pull arm hangs again whenever possible. I'm getting pumped. Better save a little for Smith Rock. <laughs> Yeah, I almost lost it right there. Smith Rocks, Oregon. Advanced free climbing. Steep walls, thin edges, and a multitude of pockets to cling to. These routes are so difficult, they're rarely climbed in one try. You must be willing to fall and come back day after day until the correct sequence of movements is worked out, the gymnastic approach to climbing. Between tries, everyone images. It's no wonder that the best climbers in the world have come here to test their skill, like world champion Lynn Hill on the overhung Rude Boys. This is the noise you want to hear. Rude Boys is so overhanging that Lynn moves as fast as she can for the difficulty of the climbing. She had been working on this climb for a week before we arrived to film her. So most of the early moves are worked out. Next, she has to go into a stem. Delicate footwork, but the only way to reach higher. And then a series of lunge moves take her up the face. Expensive in energy, but efficient in altitude. And finally, the bucket. What passes for a rest on a climb like this? A chance to clip in, chalk up, 
and consider the traverse. A foot leaves the rock, and suddenly you see how steep this climb is. Notice the hands crossed, set up for the next reach. Long sideways pulls cross the traverse. And the angle here is unrelenting. Finally, near the lip of the overhang, Lynn will set herself up for the crux of the climb. Two lunge moves, one right on top of the other. I like that time. The elbow was out. Elbow is better? I think the elbow was out. It was out still? Yeah. So I have to think, tuck the elbow in. Mm-hmm. Yeah, really, really bring it down. Yeah, it was out like this, right? Yep. Yeah. Both of them were. Really accent. Hmm. What does that do to the way you hold? It just gives me more power to have my shoulder in. You know, if, I, if it's in, or my elbow, I mean. When I'm out like this, usually that happens when I'm tired and uh, you don't have as much power for lunging in this position. So if you have your elbows down, actually this one stays out, but this one needs to be down so that when I'm lunging, I can actually sort of throw my hips too, instead of trying to lunge from this position, which is, you have to pull in much more. Come on, Good. Elbow in. Oh. Well, with a climb like Rude Boys, that's really difficult. You have to figure out how to do each move so precisely that you can do it when you're tired. And you have to do it very quickly because a little bit of hesitation can mean that much less strength for the next move. So you really have to get everything coordinated together. And there's many different things you have to be thinking about at the same time, and that's why it can take several tries before you coordinate everything and integrate it all in the same movement. It's kind of like a complex gymnastics maneuver. You learn it in steps and, and pretty soon you build up to learning a complex trick and, and it's not as simple as it may look. It actually involves a long learning process of different types of skills and then being able to utilize that to learn one trick. On an overhanging face, the most important thing is to conserve as much energy, energy as you can because it takes an incredible amount of strength just to stay on. So I, I'm constantly looking for stems, different places to, to oppose my feet. And naturally what happens is your elbows start coming out. So if the, if the face is overhanging like this, your elbows will come out to compensate for that angle. So what you want to find is places where you can stem or stand with your feet to take off the pressure of your arms. Stay, Glenn. Come on, Lynn. Stay, girl. Do it. Do it. Do it. Do it! What? I got that for. Yeah. Oh. Oh. Lynn will rest and try again. Okay, I gotta go up. Okay, then reach that little tiny edge there. Yeah, right foot on one of these things, right? Yeah, right foot up on that. Standing up to the little edge. The little edge, and then and then there's a good pocket up in there, remember? Yeah, that, that on the left? No, no, on the right. Oh, yeah? You get I that think first? so, yeah. No, I think I Here's Bobby Benzman, working on the latest Rage, 512A. After many tries, she's got these bottom moves wired, but the crux is yet to come. Lynn Hill fired this climb on her first try, an on-site or flash ascent, which is highly respected. 
Bobby is closer to her limit and uses the gymnastic approach. Work out the moves until you fall, then try again. The crux is coming up. Bobby's had trouble there before, but if she can make it through this time, coming from the ground, she'll have a red point ascent. Instead of starting over, Bobby rests and figures out the moves ahead of her. Okay, switch my feet. Let's see. Sequence is crucial here. If Bobby's feet are in the wrong place, she won't be able to grab the next hold. Mm -hmm. She tries again. I'm tired. And again. All right. She's grabbed the hole. Now she has to shift her feet into the high right pocket. Good going, stay with it. I'm tired. Working out the sequence takes determination, even if you're tired. All right, she's got her foot in the pocket. Counterbalances the free leg and reaches up the erect. There's the second hold. That's the crux. But the climb isn't over yet. It stays steep and strenuous. I think I better just come down. I'm pretty flamed. Yeah. It's starting to not be fun. Even though Bobby didn't make the red point this time, she now has the crux sequence engraved in her brain. She can be visualizing it as she rests. Get it. I think conscious visualization is, is definitely helpful because you solidify all the movements in your mind. It's almost as good as doing it physically because you are stimulating your muscles when you do that. When you're climbing up on a face and you're trying to do it on site and you're looking at possibilities looking at different edges and footholds and different things it helps to see yourself one move or so before you're there kind of project your body into that position to see if it'll work and that takes a lot of experience like for example if I'm on a face and I'm looking at a hold that's fairly big but it's a little bit out of my range I'll probably lunge to it but before I decide to lunge to it, I look at the hold, and I focus on it, and I imagine myself catching the hold before I actually do it. And that happens like two or three times before I actually pull in and lunge for it. Oh! God, that was yeah. so close. Oh. Some of the finest climbing I saw at Smith Rocks was Stefan Glovas working out on To Bolt or Not To Be, 514A. Very gymnastic. Stefan has been top roping to work out the moves. Now he's going for the red point.
to Bola Notabi, it's a, it's a very similar climbing to Europe. Um, there are, it's, it's totally face climbing, no no jams at all, and you have to just to climb on very small ledges, and they're so sharp. And uh, I think it's uh, for sure it's one of the hardest routes because it's very very long, and there are a lot of uh, very hard single moves this route. The moves, the single moves are not too hard if you have to climb it uh, just from just from the, the bolt to another bolt, but if you have to climb it in the whole, in the whole way, it will be pretty, pretty hard up there. Whoa, running out of money. Guess this climbing trip's gonna have to end. And we haven't even touched jam cracks. Sometimes the nearest rock, real rock, is a thousand expensive miles away. But climbing's where you find it, even around town. Nice traverse here, eh? This is quality. Good stone, straight cut holds, I like it. Being broke has its advantages. There's no telling what you might find, as long as you keep moving. Well, here's a crack in a corner, a lieback. It works like a side pull. Hands pull and feet push in combination. It's strenuous, but efficient. Remember to keep your feet up high. Here's a wide crack. I can wedge my foot crosswise, but it's not big enough to slide my whole body into. An off width. Off width technique is slow and strenuous. Your toe rests on the one wall and the heel ratchets down to wedge, pushing you up just inches at a time. The arm wedges between elbow and palm to hold you in place. Whoa, look at this. <laughs> Perfect size. Two inch crack. Huh, piece of cake. Good practice. Uh oh. Hey, oh, it's you again. I thought we talked about this once before. Oh, I guess we did. did have you talked to the owner? As a matter of fact, I have. I talked to Duke Cleland and he said it was okay if I practiced my climbing here in his building. Duke says it's all right? Yeah, he said it was okay. What's keeping you up there? Oh, well, well, this is a jam crack. I'm wedging my hand. I drop my thumb in there, it gets wider. Wedge that in there, tick, and hold my whole weight. Feet, I put in sideways and kind of twist them. Hurts a little bit, but works. Jamming around town has its drawbacks. You might try building a backyard climbing gym like the one that suddenly appeared behind my place when Dale Bard moved in. Two sheets of plywood high, it overhangs on all four sides. The holds are real rock, epoxied on, under pressure. Each corner is a crack machine. Two by tens bolted together so the slot between them can vary. I chose the holds for um for size, I didn't want to get them too small. There are smaller ones down here, but mainly those are footholds. But I wanted to get good edges so that it wouldn't um, stress out your, your tendons, that it would just build strength. Because after a day of bouldering, you know, your fingers are already stressed out, and what you want to do is finish it. Because your fingers are tired, but your arms and forearms still can go on. So you grab bigger holds, and you can just get the killer workout. Let's take a closer look at jamming, the classic two-inch crack. Slide your hand into the crack and roll your thumb into the palm. Your hand gets wider and locks. Thumbs up if below you. Above, thumbs down is more secure. Your weight on the jam torques it into the crack more tightly. Straight arm hangs relax your shoulders. 
Crack climbing isn't natural like face. It's a learned technique. But with practice, the hand jam becomes the most secure hold in climbing. You know, even though these things are perfect cracks and smooth and nice, they're nothing. Absolutely no comparison to the cracks of the Canyonlands. Those are real rock. I mean, let's face it, we're not out here to climb wood. We want to go play on stone. And that's where I should be. It's a matter of fact. Hey, Robinson, get off the phone. Let's go to the Canyonlands. Another day in the Canyonlands. After watching Bobby jamming Supercrack yesterday, it's easy to understand why this Utah sandstone has a reputation for the purest crack climbing in the country. Today, we'll check out a smaller size, a finger crack, and see what happens when the crack master, Dale Bard, touches stone. Uh, how'd... Since Dale has chosen a thin crack, he tapes the first two fingers as well. They're protected, but the extra thickness can be a disadvantage. Yeah, you want to make sure you don't tape too tight so you have flexibility of your hands, because otherwise if, if it restricts your hands, you tend to get pumped faster for some reason. This is the coin crack, rated 511C for being so unrelentingly okay, continuous. Ready, Bobby? Yeah. All right. From barely three quarters of an inch at the ground, the crack gradually widens, running through all the sizes up to two inches. Well, that was a good finger lock. Thin cracks are climbed with finger locks. Dale inserts his fingers past the second knuckle and twists. The camming action of the arm helps to lock them in place. Higher, the crack widens. Off fingers, slightly past the knuckle. The off-finger jam is stabilized by inserting the thumb and stacking the fingers on top of it. Feet are tougher to get into a thin crack. These little slippers are sort of unique. Dale has an advantage here. His rock slippers are so thin that he can jam a big toe. You can definitely feel everything your toes are doing. The crack gets wider and the jams change again, this time to off hands. Here, the camming action is particularly important. Arms straight. God. This crack. 
is so pretty. God, my feet hurt. Cracks are the boldest features of the rock, but climbing them is subtle. The cracks here in the Utah desert are the purest in the world, a privilege to climb. Captain, welcome home. When I first came to Yosemite, El Capitan had one route, the nose. Warren Harding took 45 days to climb it. Now the face is filled with routes, and John Backer and Peter Croft have climbed the nose in a morning. It's amazing how skills have improved in 30 years, and the confidence that has brought. kind of high off the ground, above the rocks. But he's solid, smooth, and in control. Looks like Peter Croft. Peter's been tearing this place up lately. It's not unusual for him to climb most of the major formations here in a day. To nearly anyone else, that would take a month-long climbing trip. I was inspired. I had to meet this climber. He suggested a walk in El Cap Meadow. But first, there were a few more climbs he had to do. Reed's Pinnacle Direct. Go-go. crack. Catchy. And the Nabisco Wall. A tour of Yosemite's classic free climbs in an afternoon. So I come into the valley and even before I get here all I hear about is Peter Croft soloed astronaut. How was it? Real good. I mean, that's about all I can say. It's just, it was the right thing at the right time. Um, as far as I'm concerned, it's the best long free climb, long hard free climb that I've ever seen or done. I was concentrating real hard, but I started to climb really fast. And then I realized, hey, you know what? I, I climbed too fast. I'm not gonna be enjoying this. So I slowed down a bit, and there's some killer good ledges up there. So I just like get up there, sit down, take off my shoes, take off my socks, wiggle my toes, and you know, look over at Half Dome. Perfect place to be. The reason I like doing hard climbing is not, you know, because it's 512B or 511B or whatever. It's a setting you can get into. It allows you to get to just more places, more spectacular places. You know, a lot of 
17 year old kids who have been climbing for two or three years, cranked off some pretty good pitches, are going to see these shots of you soloing and um, are going to be attracted to it. Um, and yet I worry a little about them because they don't have all the experience that you've got. Do you have any advice or caution, any words for people like that? Don't ever do it for any other reason than for yourself. Because if, say, you do blow it sometime, and as you're falling, you know, 500 feet towards the earth, if you're doing it just, you know, to make someone stand up and take notice, well, then you've had an awful joke played on you. I've had some people just come up to me and just say, man, you're nuts. You're going to kill yourself. You know, you're sowing all these crazy things. And what I try to get across is, yeah, I, I sow all those things, but I also sow a whole bunch more up to a point and then back off. But it's, it's important, actually, I mean, seriously, to get that across, that, yeah, I back off lots of roots. And if you don't take that attitude, then, man, then it is crazy. Then you are a lunatic. Peter Croft is a rare individual. Sure, he's a brilliant climber. He's earned that confidence. But what keeps him alive is his judgment. He's always willing to climb down. Approach your own limits. And if your own limits start to go down, well, you can still push towards them. And if, you know, 20 years from now, my limit is 5'8", well, I can really push towards 5'8", and, you know, maybe try to do a whole bunch of 5'6 pitches in a day or, or whatever, you know. That should be what you should be aiming at more is, is personal boundary. And that, I think that's when you're going to become your best, is when you find the approach of climbing that fits you the best. And that's not necessarily, you know, the way I climb or the way Stefan climbs or, you know, any of these guys. It's, fun, you know, trying out climbing, trying all the different ways of, of doing things and coming up with your own best approach. And that's the way it's going to become the most long-lasting. Sooner or later, climbing carries us back to wilderness. We go out to play in the mountains just to let the animal run. Movement. Way in the backcountry, miles from any road, we catch sight of the Tai Chi master, practicing his meditation through movement on rocky summits. gymnast is out here too. Todd Skinner, one of the best. Concentration makes Todd's climbing a meditation too. One of the great things about climbing is that it's not just physical. Mind is drawn in, charting moves, watching safety, and emotion. Precise gymnastics on such a wild, vertical dance floor is a dialogue with fear the deepest of all emotions. Climbing can integrate body, mind, and emotion. That makes it a powerful meditation, a physical meditation. High peaks or low boulders, rock climbing is just another way to be alive in the mountains. An excuse like holding a fishing pole is an excuse to stand on the riverbank and look around. Except that climbing adds an emotional charge. Adrenaline surges through you. It sharpens our senses, nudging climbers into a heightened awareness. Drink it in. Savor the new perspective. You'll come back down changed. Prophets have always known it. From the mountains.
Doug, thank you so much for sharing that video with us. Uh, we've set apart some time to kind of talk about the behind the scenes, like what's changed. Um, what do you want to start with? <laughs> how about how about lycra? Lycra, <laughs> a lot of lycra. You know, you couldn't have missed the the loud lycra. Some would say obnoxious in the video, but <laughs> that but it was a, such an '80s thing, right? And and sport climbing was brand new then, and it was it was fun and breaking new ground and figuring it out, refiguring climbing for being something new and exciting. There were like serious old school trad climbers who hated the idea of bolted sport routes. Okay. Uh, and I loved it. And, you know, and other people like Lynn Hill was notable for for really getting into it and yeah. became one of the leading sport climbers in the world. You wrote the Clean Climbing Manifesto. Yeah. Um, how does sport climbing fit into that? Well, most people think bolts are not clean. I think they can be very clean. Okay. But let's not go into that because right. that'll that's a black hole. You know, bolting is one of the weirdest subjects within climbing. Yeah. <laughs> But if you have a wall without cracks in it, like the walls here in your new area, there, there's no way to climb them without bolts. No way safely. No safely, yeah, yeah. yeah. Aside from sport climbing, what else has changed in the world of climbing since you did that 30 some well, years ago? Well, you know, ago? There, I think the same year it came out, 88, the very first climbing gym opened. Wow. In, on the Seattle waterfront. Wow. And I drove a thousand miles to go see it because it's like, what is this about? I got to check it out. And it was cool. I liked it, um, too. You know, some of the old old farts didn't like climbing gyms either, but that's their problem. Uh, they've taken over now, you know, and yeah, you I've I've actually had somebody walk up to me and seriously ask, so can you learn to climb outdoors? <laughs> <laughs> Well, how do you think we climbed a hundred years ago? But it's interesting that that it's shifted perspective so much, and now indoor climbing is in the Olympics, and that leads actually back to another thought. My main thought about sport climbing is not about bolts; it's about movement. Okay, it's about the, the sport climbing facilitated and and ended up encouraging the development of climbing movement. Yeah, absolutely. Which had been, you know, the old <laughs> rule of three, you only, you must have three points of contact with the rock and then you move one <laughs> and all that stuff. And it's still a good idea, of course, but um, but just wild new things like all off the rock dinos yeah. were not developed in the sport climbing here in the 80s. Yeah. They came about because of gym climbing. Yeah. Moving Over Stone was one of the first climbing videos, is that right? There, yes. It was the second by a few weeks or a month or two. John Long had a video out. Um, I forget what it's called now, but it was shot in Yosemite and it was a, kind of a slapstick approach to learning to climb. Oh, okay. And we took a little more serious um, tack in making moving over stone. I mean, there were still some fun bits in there, too. Yeah, you know, like, you got to get naked once in a while. <laughs> <laughs> Banned in elementary schools across the country. But, yeah, it was a new field. I mean, it, that's hard to realize now, too, when you know, there are hundreds of new videos every year. Some of them shot like this on iPhones and, yeah. you know, just at the crag and... Some of them get Oscars. Yeah. Yeah. Some of them are really good. Yeah. And, and I, you know, that um, quality that, that you and Ryan worked on so much, the, the, um, the chill factor, I'll call it. But, you know, you're just out there shooting with an iPhone and you're having fun. And the fun comes across on the tape. And it's not like, some of the video shoots I've been on where it's been 10 minutes setting up the camera and you run through the scene a couple of times and then you forget your lines anyway. And, um, you know, but it's, it, it 
the spontaneity really comes across. I think that's a great thing. I think that's maybe the best thing about the How Not To channel. Thanks, Doug. Uh, like keying off of that, like this is an amazing technology that allows us to do this without learning a ton of uh, camera and um, all of that goes behind that. Talk a little bit about like the process of, of creating that film from the technical side. Huh, okay. So nice. you guys have all seen maybe in retro footage, like the hold on your shoulder TV cam news camera. Mm -hmm. The news guy's got his hand over the top of the camera and the little eye thing is all set. And uh, it's 20, 30 pounds of stuff. That's what we shot with. Wow. As an analog camera, digital have, had not been invented. And the, it recorded, it had three tubes inside that were very delicately placed so that each of them would record one of the three primary colors. Okay. Um, so how you, that's how you got your picture. Well, it was the best available at the time. I mean, we were paying, I don't know, two or three hundred dollars a day to rent a camera like that. Wow. It was crazy. Thank you, sponsors. Patagonia helped us sponsor that video. Oh, that's awesome. Got us off the ground. It was delicate. We hauled them up climbs. I mean, you, you saw the footage where you're looking down on um, John Backer or Peter Croft soloing beautiful Yosemite climbs. Mm -hmm. You know, well, the cameraman got up there, hauled the camera up. In like a haul bag? No, just tied around the, the oh, handle okay. of the camera. <laughs> um, but being very careful not to bump it on the cliff because a small bump would rack those tubes out of alignment. Wow. And then your shoot was over. It had to go back to San Francisco for a technician to realign the tubes. Oh, did that happen? <laughs> it happened at Smith's Rocks. It happened at... at uh... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it happened in Canyonlands again. There was, I wish I had a shot of this, but Mike Strassman, the videographer who's brilliant, was in a phone booth with a Swiss army knife trying to get talked through fixing the camera. <laughs> <laughs> that, when we were a thousand miles away and it didn't work. So we had to, we got very glum and drove home. <laughs> oh, and then there's editing. Okay. Okay, so you have, you have these decks, which are half inch, I think it was shot on three quarter, which was had more information on it. It was very high tech and very um, information dense for the time. So we were working hard to make good quality video, but the but we had used gear too. So so we translated it down. We were working off half inch tapes, okay, so that we wouldn't reduce the quality of the image on the main tape until the very last uh, online. Okay, it's so called. are you like physically cutting the tapes? No, it isn't getting cut, it's okay. electronic. But it was being played through a deck into a, a, a source deck with the raw footage into another deck that was laying up the the rough cut, it was okay. called. I mean, it, we were fine tuning it to within frames, except that our decks wouldn't stop and start within one frame. They would start and stop within half a second. Oh. So you're backing it up going, yeah, that's about half a second. Then, you know, you want to match cut like somebody talking. Yeah. Uh, you know, or, or a piece of action, the leg moving, um, <laughs> which, which is hard to do when you can't do it frame by frame. You're... You're setting the deck for half a second before and going, yeah, this is probably it. Nope, we would missed it. We'll go back and try it again. So it took months and months to do the offline. Wow. Um, and then, and we had another sponsor at that point too, too, because we'd run out of money. And so he, Austin, came out to the West Coast when he heard we were nearly done, and he went into the online. We were paying $110 an hour night rate for the online video. There wow. was a mainframe computer and it was this heavy duty, you know, high tech stuff. So 
Austin sits in there with us. <laughs> We're running all night with this operator working the working the decks, and he goes, "Oh, wait a minute, let's change that part." <laughs> we go. No, 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 this is like, we're going to waste hundreds of dollars here. I know it's your money, but so it's so much easier now when you can just cut on a laptop. Yeah, absolutely. Anybody can do it. Yeah, even me. You can me. add music to it. We had great music. Yeah, you did. Special fun was the, the Santa Cruz mm -hmm. band that my new girlfriend, then later the mother of my kids, um, knew about and brought us to. And boy, thank you, Special Fun there. I hope you like the music in it, you know? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so you've talked about a, a cameraman and help with editing. What was the rest of your crew? Do you have a, an audio yeah. tech? Yeah, who now runs a TV station in Mammoth, uh, Dan McConnell. Okay. Was the general audio tech and mm -hmm. gopher for everything else. And we crammed the three of us into my small car to drive around the West and the cases of, you know, with the filming gear. So poor Dan was like in the back seat with his legs up over cases of video <laughs> gear. Talk about some of the, the reaction to the film in 88 and 89. Well, yeah, that's a good question because people didn't, you know, what do you mean, climbing video? Oh, oh, there's Lynn Hill. I've heard of her. Wow, she's doing the hardest thing that's ever been led by a woman before. That's pretty, I'm interested. And then she's sitting there talking calmly about technique and how, you, how she made this work. Um, so it all worked together and it, it helped us to do what we set out to do, which was to split the difference between inspiration and instruction and i think we succeeded you know i'm i'm really happy with the film we made still so it's fun to be able to put it on my favorite youtube channel <laughs> thanks <Doug. laughs> and no seriously you guys are good and it's the lightheartedness that makes it so good i'm thrilled to be able i hope you guys out there can like it you know at least part of it, you know, skim through, whatever. But uh, it's fun to be, it was fun for us to make it. It was radical cutting edge at the time to even think of making a, a video with rock stars in it and, and instruction too, both basic instruction and how to do the most advanced moves that were being done at the yeah. time. Well, I know there's a whole generation of climbers who I've talked to a number of them who've been inspired by this film and like it was part of their education and it was a very formative uh, experience for them and i hope it is as interesting and helpful to you as it was to them and to us nice what projects are you working on now i finished recently an article i'm very excited about about mentorship <laughs> and okay. in Guiding, especially since as I was a young guide starting at 20, 21 years old, was mentored by some really wonderful people, Don Jensen and Bob Swift, who I revere to this day. They're both gone. And then talking about what mentorship is in general, broadening it, what's it, what is it? You know, and it took me a while to come up with a definition that I really liked. Which I can't quote to you right now, but it's in the article. Um, you can find this stuff on my website, by the way, uh, movingoverstone.com. So to go back, you mentioned the AMGA, the American Mountain Guides Association, in the beginning, and I was the first president and struggling to even keep the people who thought it was a terrible idea to have a guides association to see if I could bring them into the fold. It was really my main work was one-on-one -on -one with with individual guides who were skeptical or unsure. The MGA now has, I think, 5,000 members, 1,500 certified people with various forms of certification. And it, so it's a big success. And it, um, however, along the way, it became more formalized in the way that people are certified for climbing. So I got certified by my mentors 
they would just sit like this and talk about, well, what are you doing? How was it today? You know, with the, you know, I know that client was tough in a, in one way. And so we talk about that. And anyway, uh, it's, it feels unfortunate to me, inevitable, but unfortunate that we now have um, structures of uh, checklists for becoming a guide. Okay. And that's necessary but not sufficient in my view to becoming a good guide. I felt so lucky to have mentors who I could turn to and talk to in real time and they knew the clients and they knew me and they knew the climbs. So it was an intimate relationship about what we were doing. Totally. Ideally, I would like to see that come back. Uh, I'd like to see mentorship really thrive, not just in climbing, but in every field. You know, I was just talking to a journalist the other, an hour ago about, this and she brought it up too yeah the popularity of climbing we we're talking about you going to the first climbing gym and some of the first climbing movies out there like that explosion has really changed the dynamic of it and personally yeah mentorship i feel is super important and if if you can be somebody that mentors somebody or if you can find a mentor uh that's going to keep you generally a lot safer in the mountains. And then those are the incredible relationships that you'll remember forever. Yeah, yeah, it's so true. And I think that like some of the video that you guys have shot goes a ways towards that by being interactive. You got, well, how does this work? Bobby, you tell me, <laughs> and you do. You know, it's like, okay, how to multi-pitch, how to repel. We've, we've worked on those things together. Yeah. And that that's really great. But there's another step beyond that. Yeah, that, that is no substitute is for right, having somebody here. Right here. Yeah. How cool is that, that we get to share Doug's video on this channel, and then he got to share some of the history behind the scenes of that history. He is totally gonna to be reading the comment section. So show him some love, ask him some questions, and we'll see if he'll respond to those. It's fun to hear him talk about the climbing gym he drove a thousand miles to go to. When I first moved up to Washington, I was one mile away from it. I like what he said about mentorship. Our videos are not to replace that. Our videos are to help you understand what you're looking at when you go with somebody who knows what they're doing. And I want you to stay safe out there and uh, let me know what you wanna see next. Cheers.